From Freaky Friday to Ted, Big to Aladdin, and Bedazzled to Pinocchio, Hollywood has been churning out movies about wish fulfillment since the birth of film. But whatever it is granting the wishes, the message is always the same. Be careful what you wish for. Or more accurately, the message is just not to wish at all. The grass is rarely greener on the other side. That is never more true than in horror movies, where wishing on a monkey's paw won't just teach you a lesson about being grateful for what you already have, it might also see you and your loved ones killed in the most horrendously excruciating of ways. If you rubbed a lamp and wished for a list of horror movie wishes that went horribly wrong, then you're in luck. ABCs of Death 2 ABCs of Death 2 is, funnily enough, the sequel to 2012's The ABCs of Death. Like its predecessor, it's made up of 26 alphabet-themed horror vignettes. But these are not movies you should use as an educational aid for your children. The segment W is for Wish opens with a 1990s-style commercial for champions of Zorb action figures, clearly inspired by He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. One of the boys in the commercial wishes he could help the heroic Prince Cassio and his crew battle against the evil mind Lord Zorb. Upon making the wish, the two kids are transported to a desolate wasteland of a planet in the far-flung reaches of the universe. An exploding head and a disembowelment later, the villainous Zorb fries one of the boys, literally fries him, before the other boy finds himself chained up in a dungeon with Fantasy Man. Contrary to his action figure, Fantasy Man is old and paunchy and insists on referring to the boy as Princess, before rescuing him by bundling him into a sack and carrying him away to an unknown fate. Wishmaster. This list wouldn't have been complete without featuring at least one entry from the Wishmaster franchise. As it happens, this is the first of three and is from Robert Kurtzman's 1997 original. Johnny Valentine, Candyman himself, Tony Todd, is a doorman with a cool name and is taking no nonsense from anyone whose name isn't on the guest list for Robert Englund's party. More on that later including the Wishmaster himself. When pressed by the Wishmaster, Johnny reveals that he'd love to escape. He meant from his job and his life as he knows it. But in typical Wishmaster fashion, Valentine's wish is taken considerably more literally than that, as he's transported to a Houdini-style locked water tank. The last we see of the unsuspecting doorman is him thrashing around in the water tank, desperate for air and fighting against his straitjacket. So Valentine doesn't get his wish at all, but he is given the opportunity to make it come true for him himself, as long as he can make it out of the straitjacket and bust through the padlock. It's fair to assume it didn't end well for him. Wish Upon. This one hits where it hurts. Clearly, the makers of 2017 Boarfest Wish Upon knew that the surest way to signal all is not well is to go for the defenseless pet. Can't directors just leave dogs alone? But they need something to hook viewers in because nothing else about this movie was gonna do it. When Claire's father is out dumpster diving, he comes across a Chinese music box, which he gives to Claire as a birthday present. Here, honey, I got you some trash. Don't worry, I spit wiped off the rat pee. But obviously, it's not just any old music box. This one has the power to grant wishes at a cost. Claire wishes for Darcy, the school bully, to rot. And that's pretty much what happens as Darcy contracts a flesh-eating bug that eats its way through her. But Claire's wish comes with a huge price tag in the form of her dog, Max. Max dies in the crawl space under the house as he's eaten alive by rats. Not cool, just not cool. The Gate 2, The Trespassers. Proving that death and destruction isn't always the consequence of making wishes, The Gate 2 gave us something a little more lighthearted in the way of karma. Having learned nothing from the previous movie, Terence decides to reopen the portal to hell, because horror movie characters are idiots. But if they weren't, there would never be any horror movies at all. He summons forth a wish-granting stop-motion minion like the ones that ran amok in the first film. He doesn't keep hold of the little critter for long, as it is soon stolen from him by teenage Ned do wells, John and Mo. The pair decide to dine at a fancy restaurant, having wished for and been granted bundles of cash. Because that's what teenage thieves want, right? Not booze or drugs, fine dining and a bit of culture. But it was never going to be as easy as that. As they attempt to pay for the bill for their gourmet nosh, their magic money turns to poo. Yes, they slap down a handful of fecal matter as payment. They're definitely going to be made to do the washing up after that. Leprechaun 2. The Leprechaun series of movies are best known for an early appearance by a young Jennifer Aniston. They're also known for being pretty bad. Mostly for being bad, but at least they're fun. The second outing for Warwick Davies' Irish trickster sees the eponymous Leprechaun trapped in a cast iron safe for reasons. Determined to break free from his mini prison, he grants his captors wish for gold. Not just any gold, but the Leprechaun's very own pot of gold. This was never going to be a good idea. The old man gets what he wants, sort of, when the pot and its shiny contents materialize. 
in his stomach, stretching his gut and rendering him incapacitated. But it doesn't end there. He uses his second wish to free the leprechaun so that he can help him, though what sort of help could he possibly have expected? And his third and final wish is for the pot of gold to be taken out of him. The leprechaun obliges in typical leprechaun fashion by slashing open the man's stomach and taking back his gold. Wishmaster. Having got past doorman Johnny Valentine, see previous Wishmaster entry, the Wishmaster ends up at a party hosted by Raymond Beaumont, played by Freddy Krueger himself, Robert Englund. Beaumont wishes for his party to be a memorable one. He was probably thinking of Stephen Fry in one corner, regaling the guests with amusing tales, maybe Bill Murray in another being Bill Murray. And while his wish certainly does come true, it's probably best remembered by the crime scene investigators who arrived after than any of the actual guests. Upon Beaumont making his wish, the party descends into bloody mayhem as his various sculptures and statues and paintings come to life and begin a murderous rampage. One lady quips that her gentleman friend can see right through her when she turns to glass and explodes, firing shards of herself into anyone nearby. The monkey's paw. In the 2013 adaptation of this classic story, Jake and his friend Cobb come by the monkey paw in a bar where Jake wishes for the Mustang in the parking lot. But he crashes his new ride while taking it for a spin, which results in the death of Cobb. What follows is an unselfish wish that still ends as badly as any other on this list. Jake wishes that Cobb was not dead, and Cobb does indeed come back to life, but as a soulless madman. Oops. He's determined to make Jake use his final wish to allow Cobb to see his son, who's been kept from him by his ex-wife. In order to ensure that happens, Cobb decides to make sure that Jake doesn't use his last wish for anything else. Firstly, Cobb suspects that Jake might wish to get his ex back from her new partner, so he murders her new beau by crushing his head in a machine press. Next, Cobb reasons that Jake may wish for money to pay his sick mother's medical bills, so he kills her as well. Jake uses his final wish to ask for Cobb's soul to return. Cobb consequently has a breakdown and kills himself. Tales from the Crypt. In 1972, legendary British horror movie makers Amicus decided to bring to life the stories of America's EC comics. Tales from the Crypt is an anthology movie consisting of five vignettes and stars Ralph Richardson as the Crypt Keeper. The segment entitled Wish You Were Here is a variation on the familiar Monkey's Paw story and sees married couple Enid and Ralph realize that their Chinese figurine can grant three wishes. Enid wishes for a fortune and it is granted. Typically, this is followed by tragedy as Ralph is killed in a car crash. The grief-stricken wife uses her second wish to bring Ralph back just as he was before the accident. But as it turns out, Ralph died just before the accident. He had a heart attack at the wheel. Instead of seeing the writing on the wall and allowing her dead husband to rest in peace, Enid uses her final wish to bring her husband back to life to live forever. Having been embalmed, Ralph returns to life suffering the horrific effects of the embalming fluid. Enid attempts to end Ralph's pain by killing him, but she wished for him to live forever, trapping him in eternal agony. The Room Not Tommy Wiseau's cult classic, this one is from 2019 and stars Olga Kurilenka as Kate, who along with her husband Matt, moves into a new home where they discover a room that grants them unimaginable riches. Kate grows bored of her newfound wealth, realizing that none of it really has any value but there is something she really wants. After two miscarriages, Kate desperately wants to be a mother. With scant regard for the possible consequences, Kate wishes for a baby. Upon leaving the house, the cash in Matt's pocket granted by the room has turned to dust. He soon realizes that anything granted by the room can never leave the room. You see where this is going. Kate leaves to take the baby for a walk, only to watch her newborn son age before her eyes into a young child. Here's where it gets gross. Matt and Kate's son Shane realizes the power of the room and goes outside to age himself into a man. He attempts to murder his parents. The couple are forced to kill their own child by locking him out of the house until he crumbles to dust. The sting in the tail at the end is that Kate is pregnant, with no idea whether the child is Matt's or Shane's. Yikes. Wishmaster 2, Evil Never Dies. The Wishmaster franchise continued in 1999 with this made-for-TV sequel. It sees the Wishmaster surrender to the police after being discovered at the scene of a burglary at a museum that he takes the blame for. In the form of his alter ego, Nathaniel Demarest, the evil djinn is taken off to a holding cell full of cons, whose souls he can claim in exchange for his twisted wishes. One of his fellow inmates wishes to walk through the bars of the cell and out of the jail to freedom. In the words of Julia Roberts, big mistake, huge. 
He doesn't so much walk through the bars as is squeezed through them like beef through a mincer. His bones are crushed and his flesh ripped off as his body is forced through the tiny gap between the cell bars. His screams soon turn to silence as he's squashed through the bars like so much meat and he lands on the other side as a puddle of pate ready to be scooped off the floor. He's technically out of the cell and free, but very, very dead. Being able to speak in the gin. 2021's low-budget supernatural horror The Djinn revolves around a mute boy, Dylan Jacobs, who moves to a new house and discovers an old book with instructions for summoning a djinn. That is, a genie. Even though the book flatly warns that the djinn will grant wishes to users in a way that results in unintended consequences, a desperate Dylan nevertheless wishes via sign language to finally have a voice. Dylan certainly gets his wish granted by film's end, but it's absolutely one he ultimately comes to regret with every fibre of his being. After surviving a night of torment at the hands of the djinn, in an attempt to test his strength of will before granting the wish, Dylan indeed gains the ability to speak, but this ability is consequently taken from his father, Michael. In the movie's final moments, a distraught Dylan comforts his wounded, mute father and begs the djinn to return and undo his wish. However, with the djinn having fulfilled his duty, it returns to its book, leaving Dylan to deal with the horrific fallout of his botched wish bringing her friends back to life in All Cheerleaders Die. The aptly titled All Cheerleaders Die revolves around a group of cheerleaders who are killed in a car accident before being resurrected by their friend Lena using wicker magic. What at first appears to be a miraculous revival is soon enough revealed to be anything but. The girls have in fact come back as ravenous zombies who must feast on human flesh. Oh, and most of their personalities have changed in wildly toxic ways. It's certainly not what Lena envisioned when she carried out the incantation, in turn causing a substantial body count and all but one of the cheerleaders ending up dead again by film's end. Though Lena seems to get something of a happy ending when she reconciles with her ex, the one surviving cheerleader Maddie, the sequel baiting Stinger more or less puts the kibosh on that. As Lena and Maddie kiss, Lena's magic inadvertently resurrects one final cheerleader, Alexis, who appears to be very, very angry with Lena about it. The end. Wishing her mother would die in Piwacket. Piwacket follows a black magic-obsessed teenager, Leah, who following her father's death is forced to move to a remote house with her grieving mother. An intense argument between the two sees Leah head out into the nearby woods and wish for her mother's death, eventually performing a ritual to summon the demon Piwacket to kill her. It doesn't take long for Leah to regret this though. She soon enough starts getting on better with her mother, forcing Leah to figure out a way to stop the demon. Leah's attempt to perform a ritual to undo the curse is interrupted when Piwacket deceptively assumes the form of her mother. When Leah's actual mother returns home later, Leah is convinced she's really the demon in disguise, and so down houses her in gasoline before setting her on fire, killing her. In the final scene, Leah is being interviewed by the police about the fire, and she realises that, in fact, she burned her own mother to death while trying to defeat the demon. Her wish came true in the most horrifying, self-fulfilling manner possible, and long after she regretted making it. Trying to resurrect Chucky in Bride of Chucky Bride of Chucky begins with Chucky's former lover, Tiffany Valentine, taking possession of the Chucky doll's gruesome remains, stitching him back together and performing a voodoo ritual which she believes will resurrect him so they can be together again. The ritual indeed brings Chucky back as a doll, but after a short-lived harmonious reunion, the pair come to blows when Tiffany learns that Chucky never intended to marry her prior to his death. Tiffany responds by locking Chucky in a playpen, only for him to escape and murder her by throwing a TV in the bathtub, electrocuting her. The piece de resistance, though. Chucky then enacts the voodoo ritual to transport her soul into the bride doll she mockingly bought, so she can feel his anguish of being trapped in a doll. Unsurprisingly, Tiffany isn't thrilled about living as a doll, and spends the rest of the movie teaming with Chucky to find human vessels to transfer their souls back into. Saving her pregnant sister in absentia. Mike Flanagan's indie horror Absentia sees a pregnant woman, Trisha, struggling to deal with the reappearance of her husband after a seven-year absence, and how it relates to a mysterious tunnel which seems to be responsible for the disappearance of many local people. At film's end, Trisha and her younger sister, Callie, are attacked by a monster seemingly residing within the tunnel walls, resulting in Trisha also disappearing. Callie later returns to the tunnel to offer the entity a trade, wishing to lay down her life in order to save that of her pregnant sister. 
Foster. However, because Callie isn't specific about the nature of the deal, simply shouting, trade, the creature responds by materialising Trisha's bloody fetus and when Callie attempts to flee the tunnel, the monster claims her also, leaving behind only her shoe. In attempting to make a bargain with the creature, Callie only ensured that both herself and her pregnant sister ended up trapped in the tunnel with the entity forevermore. What a bummer. Wishing their fantasies came true in Hobgoblins. 1988's low-budget comedy horror Hobgoblins may be largely remembered as a frankly terrible Gremlins ripoff, but it's also entirely concerned with the notion that your wildest fantasies might not be so great in reality, especially if they're brought to life by the titular creatures. Basically, the Hobgoblins will make the dreams of anyone they encounter come true, but then use said dreams to kill them. Case in point, the movie opens with a security guard accidentally awakening the Hobgoblins and suddenly imagining himself as a rock star, but he he ends up falling off the stage to his death. As for the movie's central characters, Amy wishes to be less sexually repressed and become a stripper, leading to her very nearly having sex with a nightclub's gross bouncer while under the Hobgoblin's control, until her friends save her. Then Nick becomes a brave commando, only to get set on fire after jumping on a grenade, yet bizarrely he returns later in the film with only superficial injuries. Eventually the heroes do triumph over the Hobgoblins and come to appreciate there's no magic shortcut to getting what you want. All of Estrella's wishes in Tigers Are Not Afraid. The terrific genre-bending crime fantasy horror film Tigers Are Not Afraid centers around a young Mexican girl, Estrella, who is given three pieces of chalk, each of which will grant her one wish. Unfortunately though, not one of the wishes turns out how poor Estrella intends. First off, she wishes for her disappeared mother, implied to be a victim of cartel violence, to return, yet she only comes back as a ghost. For her second wish, after being tasked with killing a cartel member, she sneaks into his apartment with a gun and wishes that she doesn't have to kill him. In an instant, he dies suddenly of his own accord without her needing to do the deed. And finally, street orphan Shine asks Estrella to use her third wish to remove the burn scars on his face. Though she initially refuses after the negative outcomes of both prior wishes, she eventually relents at film's end, at which point crime boss Chino suddenly shows up and shoots Shine in the face, killing him. Yeah, after the first two wishes went so horribly awry, it was probably time to quit, don't you think? Bringing her son back to life in Death Dream Bob Clark's 1974 cult horror film Death Dream is unabashedly inspired by W. W. Jacobs' short story The Monkey's Paw, which of course revolves around wishes which have unintended consequences. The movie begins with American soldier Andy Brooks dying in the Vietnam War, but his grief-stricken mother Christine categorically refuses to accept his death and wishes for him to return, and then inexplicably shows up at the family home in the middle of the night. The family relieved at an apparent clerical error reporting his demise no matter that Andy claims that he was indeed dead. As it turns out, Andy has come back as a supernatural revenant, not unlike a vampire or zombie, who needs to inject himself with the blood of others to keep his decaying body operational. This leads to many deaths, including the suicide of Andy's own father after he sees what has become of his son, before Andy finally wastes away to nothing in a graveyard and his mother is left grieving over his rotted remains. Was it really worth it, Christine? Wishing her dad was dead in The Outing 1987's cult B-movie The Outing revolves around an ancient lamp which contains a malevolent gin and a bracelet which, when worn, will grant the wearer's wish. When the lamp and bracelet end up in the possession of her archaeologist father, teenager Alex Wallace sneakily tries the bracelet on and, following an argument, tells her father that she sometimes wishes he was dead. Yeah, you can probably see where this is going, right? First and foremost, though, this enables the gin to possess Alex and embark on a brutal killing spree at the Natural History Museum where her father works. After Alex's friends have been killed by the djinn, her father realises what's happening and races to the museum to save her. And just as she wished, he ends up paying a fatal price for it. Alex's father is killed by the djinn, and the djinn then uses his corpse in an attempt to trick Alex, who didn't see her father die. Alex figures out the ruse, however, and finally banishes the djinn by throwing the lamp into an incinerator. All the same, maybe just leave ancient trinkets alone, yeah? 
The Colour Out of Space. This film has earned a bit of a reputation as another bonkers Nick Cage flick, similar to 2018's Mandy, but this sci-fi horror has so much more going for it than that, including a wish that arguably sets the whole plot rolling along its path of Lovecraftian madness. In the opening scene, Wick and daughter Lavinia wishes for her mother's cancer to be eradicated by appealing to otherworldly and higher powers. Oh, and she happens to use the Necronomicon. This fictional staple of Lovecraft's world never has anything good come from it, just ask Ash from the Evil Dead movies because he will be the first to tell you. The meteorite that then crashes onto the idyllic alpaca farm is arguably summoned by Lavinia's meddling with forces she doesn't understand. But she doesn't stop there. When things get increasingly worse for the family, Lavinia again decides to draw on her trusty little book of evil and destruction to wish to be taken out of this mess and leave the farm. A little bit of incantation there, a bit of self-mutilation for a blood sacrifice there, just to seal the deal. At the end of the film, Lavinia's family are dead, she becomes fully absorbed into the entity from the meteorite herself, vanishing into the ether. So she did leave the farm as she wished to, just not as she had planned. Dog Soldiers. One of the most terrifying British horror films ever made, 2002's Dog Soldiers tells the tale of a squad of British soldiers doing a very nice and simple training exercise in the Scottish Highlands. It goes wonderfully and they all go home unscathed. Nah, just kidding, they'd get attacked by a pack of hungry werewolves out for blood and must engage in a bloody battle for survival. Not only is it a tightly knit story with fantastic effects, genuine chemistry between the characters and some pant-wettingly frightening werewolves, there is also a blink and you'll miss it mention of a wish gone horribly wrong. During the film, the soldiers come across zoologist Megan, who gives them refuge in an old abandoned house. However, she is revealed to be one of the werewolves all along, having been effectively adopted by the pack several years prior to the film. It's something she accepts and even blames herself for. She states that she had come to the Glen with the wish to be at one with nature, ironically noting that's exactly what she got. Let that serve as a warning to everyone wanting to have a staycation in the woods this year. Pet Cemetery. In both the original 1989 film and the 2019 remake, we're warned that sometimes dead is better. Listen, if the creepy burial ground for pets always has a musical cue of eerie children singing, it's a really good idea to stay the f away from it. The Creed family don't heed that warning, however, as when their cat church is killed, Patriarch Lewis buries it in the Mi'kmaq burial ground beyond the Critter Cemetery, after being told to do so by his mysterious neighbour Judd. The cat returns, but not as cuddly as he once was, yowling and snarling and scratching. Lewis doesn't learn his lesson, though. When his infant son Gage is hit by a truck and perishes, his daughter Ellie wishes that God would bring her brother back to life. Luckily for her, Lewis knows just the way to do that. Back to the cemetery he goes. Once the sun rises, however, all hell breaks breaks loose with scalpel slashings and throat chompings galore. We completely understand wishing for your dead son to come back to life, but if it's a gnarly little zombie kid, no thank you. While the 2019 reimagining swaps the roles and has Ellie die in the accident, this version of Lewis still ignores the obvious and his wish to be reunited with his daughter backfires horribly. The Craft. The horrors of high school are bad enough, and it just gets worse when you throw witchcraft into the mix. Social misfits Bonnie, Nancy, Sarah, and Rochelle decide to dabble in a little bit of witchcraft to make their lives better and inflict pain on the classmates that have been making their lives hell. Each girl casts a spell that relates back to her specific needs. Nancy wishes for power, Rochelle wishes for her racist bully to get her comeuppance, burn victim Bonnie wishes for beauty, and Sarah wishes for her crush to like her back. Things seem to go pretty well for the teenage coven initially, but soon their wishes begin to have horrific effects. The racist bully's hair begins to fall out to the point where the bully becomes severely traumatised, Sarah's crush is so infatuated with her that he tries to assault her, and Nancy? Well, the goth girl icon goes mad with power. Not only do their wishes impact those around them, but they also come back to haunt the girls. They lose their friends, their powers, and Nancy loses her freedom when she's committed to a psychiatric ward. I reckon this list is actually just teaching us all not to mess around with witchcraft. Coraline. Coraline is a horror film and I'm not taking questions on the matter. If you weren't utterly traumatised by this movie as a kid, you're either plain evil or just plain wrong. Coraline Jones yearns for adventure and a more exciting family, which she stumbles across once a portal to another world opens in the house she has recently moved into. There she finds a world just like ours, but seemingly better in every way. Delicious food, doting parents, fantastical theatre performances from her various neighbours, and even a talking cat. What's not to love? Well, for starters, there's the threat of having buttons sewn in your eyes. Then there's the realisation that the other mother is in fact a monstrous spider demon thing who wants to eat Coraline's soul and keep her captive forever. Oh, and Coraline's real family are imprisoned by the other mother, leaving her no choice but to confront her fears and this horrible creature. Coraline handles the concept of wishes gone wrong remarkably well for a kid's film, even though it's still one of the creepiest and most truly frightening films to explore the theme. The Shining. There really isn't more that I can say about this incredible film that hasn't been said already. Legendary, horrifying, mystifying, and just a bloody
bloody good movie, The Shining has been discussed to the ends of the earth and back again, but there is a little something within the film that makes it slot very nicely into this list. After being confronted by the equally iconic and terrifying Grady twins, Danny Torrance goes to have a little natter with his pa, Jack Torrance. Jack doesn't seem to be all that there, however, as he tells his son about how much he loves the Overlook Hotel and that he wishes they could stay there forever and ever. At various points in the movie, it's hinted at that this is exactly what happens to Jack. One instance of this is where he meets Delbert Grady, the father of the Grady twins who informs Jack that he has in fact always been the caretaker. The mystery is deepened by the end of the film where the final shot is a photo from 1921 with guests and presumably staff members of the Overlook having a right old shindig, but Jack Torrance is standing smack dab in the centre of the photo, a big grin on his face. Was he always the caretaker after all, or did his wish simply come true, eternally woven into the fabric of the hotel? Open Graves it's a shame when a cool concept is wasted on a far less cool movie. Open Graves follows the curse that a witch named Mamba implements after her execution during the Spanish Inquisition. What is the curse, you ask? Well, her flayed skin is used to make a board game, as you do, where whoever wins it is granted a wish, the losers being disposed of in ways that the game had predicted. As I said, a certainly unique idea. The modern day characters who make the mistake of playing the game are killed off in inventive ways that include, but are not limited to, being torn apart by crabs, falling into a pit of snakes, and aging into an old woman. It's like Jumanji, but somehow more dark. Even the wishes that are granted to the winners of the game come with a price, but the horror and intrigue is lost amid terrible acting, a myriad of unlikable characters, and some truly, um, interesting attempts at CGI. This really is quite sad, as the film's concept alone had the potential to be something very special. Dead Friend slash The Ghost slash Ri Young. This underrated and suspenseful Korean horror film from 2004, titled Ri Yong in Korea, and also known under the name The Ghost, was part of a trend of horror films in the country that took place within a high school setting in the late 90s and early 2000s. The film opens with a seance conducted by Yoon Jung and her two friends, which is interrupted by Yoon Jung's older sister, Yoon Seo. The wiser sibling chastises the three girls for wasting their time with silly cultish things when they could be studying. An angry and humiliated Yoon Jung wishes that the ghost they summoned would take her sister away. I wonder if if you can tell where this is going. In a tense and creepy scene featuring Asian horror cinema staples like long black hair and truly horrific supernatural happenings, Yun Seo is indeed killed by being drowned. It's unsettling and really disturbing to watch, as Yun Seo gasps and gags as water pours from her mouth, all due to her sister's careless wishing. Hellraiser. As Pinhead himself states in Hellbound Hellraiser 2, it is not hands that call us, it is desire. Despite being portrayed by pop culture and the later, lesser Hellraiser sequels, the Cenobites are more than just your average slashers. Once mortal humans, their souls were transformed in hell after succumbing to their urges for hedonistic and downright bizarre forms of bodily pleasure. That pleasure is sought after by Frank Cotton in the first Hellraiser film, who had heartily consumed all other forms of delight. The puzzle box he opens at the start of the film came with the promise that it would grant any and all carnal desires. He does get that, but the problem is the world of Cenobite pleasure is very, very different to our own. Plus, their kink domain is literal hell, meaning that the human extremes at S and M are even more hardcore in the Cenobite realm. Being flayed alive doesn't exactly sound like the sexiest way to spend your evenings, but hey, it's what Frank wished for, and who are we to kink shame? 